Welcome to the Powder Cake Podcast, the show that plugs you into the massive opportunities in startups and innovation in tech hubs beyond Silicon Valley that are exploding with potential. I'm your host, Matt Hunkler, and in today's episode, we are replaying one of my favorite conversations that I had last summer. This deep dive is with Ruben Harris, who is the CEO at Career Karma and co-host of the Breaking Into Startups podcast. In this replay episode of the Powder Cake Podcast, you're going to learn a number of things, including what people should know about working in startups and how it's different from working at a large company, ideas for finding the best companies to work for, and strategies for breaking into tech. Uh, and we cover all of this and a lot, lot more. Um, but before we dive into all of that, would you like to discover even more interesting companies, stories, and strategies to help you reach your full potential? Then get the inside scoop with Powder Keg's hand curated newsletter, The Spark, delivered to your inbox each week with the tech news and opportunities outside of Silicon Valley that you need to know. Just go to powderkeg.com and sign up right on the homepage. Each Thursday, for absolutely free, you're going to get an email directly from me with the most important stories, trends, and companies in tech. And it's curated by the entire Powder Keg team, as well as some of the most connected people in tech hubs between the coasts with insights that you're not going to find anywhere else. So again, that's powderkeg.com, P-O-W-D-E-R-K-E-G, powder keg, all one word. Uh, and that's powderkeg.com. So today's guest is Ruben Harris, who is not only the co-host of the Breaking Into Startups podcast, but he's also the CEO of Career Karma, which is an organization that matches people who want to learn to code with the right circle and coding bootcamp for their needs. Throughout this episode, Ruben goes in depth on the specific skills that you need to develop to ignite your career in tech. Ruben Harris is a Bay Area transplant from Atlanta, Georgia, where he served as an advisor for Forge and organized Atlanta's first healthcare hackathon. Over the past couple of years, Ruben has worked with academics, organizers, politicians, and union leaders at Hustle, Honor, and Alt School focused on improving their personalized outreach, healthcare, and education. Ruben began his technology career working in partnerships and sales after writing a viral blog post called Breaking Into Startups about how he moved to San Francisco without a job and landed a position three weeks later. After that article, Ruben co-founded the Breaking Into Startups podcast to demystify the process of breaking into tech. He went on to start a company called Career Karma, which is an app that helps job training programs find qualified applicants. They work with some of the top coding boot camps and are a graduate of the Y Combinator Accelerator. I recorded this back in June of 2019, and we get into a lot of great strategies for breaking into tech. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ruben as much as I did. Let's dive right in. Ruben, thanks for being here, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, you've been you've been busy. I didn't realize that was 66. You're always all the way up to 90. That's what, November until now? That's that's I respect that a lot, man. Thank you for having me here. Try to be consistent, man. I respect it. I respect it. And well, it's one been day we're going to have you on the, on our podcast as well. So thank you for having me. Well, I definitely look forward to that and sharing the, uh, the story of this awesome community here at Powder Keg. But I know this community is going to be very interested in what you've been up to these last few months. Um, you know, ba basically half a year, you've made some huge leaps in your business. And I love capturing the founder story, like right in the heart of it. And I feel like yeah. you're at that inflection point right now. Exactly. So, before we dive into kind of where you are today, could you maybe give a little bit of context, um, maybe for those uh, who haven't listened to your episode for six months or maybe didn't hear the first one, of you know, how did you decide in the first place that you wanted to be involved in startups and be involved in tech? Yeah, I mean, you, you touched on it briefly. Um, when we, can we pause it one second? Yeah. Sorry. T Timor, 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 I'm recording a podcast. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're yeah, good. So, so um, hold on one second. Thank you. Hold on. All right. So, yeah. So just like you touched on earlier in the podcast, um, you know, we moved to the Bay Area without knowing anybody. And then three weeks, we found a job. My co-founders, they moved out with me as well. Um, they did coding boot camps and got jobs. And essentially, we we had to go through a bunch of hoops to figure out how to get jobs in tech um, that didn't require just training. And so essentially we built Career Karma as a product that we wish that we had when we were trying to break into tech. Um, like you mentioned, um, I spent some time working at Alt School focused on personalized education. Um, I focus a lot of time focused on voc vocational training for nurses and building out two-sided marketplaces when I was at Honor. 
I worked a lot with labor union leaders, like you said, and workforce development people when I was at Hustle. And my co-founder, um, after they did uh, coding boot camps, they spent time um, at Funding Circle all the way until IPO, really understanding finance um, and building credit models. And then my other co-founder was um, in the augmented reality world, bridging the online and the offline worlds. Um, and so um, during our time working at these different startups over a matter of three years, uh, we launched Breaking Startups, where we interviewed several people that also broke into tech mm -hmm. uh, without going to college or they had different traditional backgrounds. And after hearing hundreds of stories, now I think we're, we're over 110 episodes now, um, we were able to really get a sense of the similarities. And we created a three-week process of how to get prepared for these boot camps. And we started calling that the 21 Day Challenge. And that started to be, go very viral. And people started tweeting about Career Karma every single day. Um, we applied to Y Combinator and decided to productize that experience. And for the people that aren't familiar with Y Combinator, the first thing that they tell you is uh, focus on getting people, 100 people to love you. And what started off as trying to get 100 people to love us turned into 100 people downloading the app every single day, mothers telling their daughters, sisters telling their brothers, people telling their friends, and, and, and thousands of people essentially taking control of their careers and changing the very fabric of their families. And at the end well, of the day, our North Star... Go ahead. I'll go ahead, man. I was just going to say, our North Star has always been to empower people to make their most important career decisions. And the first decision that we're helping people make is which bootcamp is best for them. Uh, because that's what helped uh, my brother and my co-founders get there. I um, mean, we essentially want to help a billion people in 10 years. So that's how, that's how we got to this point. Oh, there's so much there that I want to uh, back up and dive into a little <laughs> bit more. Um, take, take me back to the experience of working at some of these places or working with some of these places like Hustle, Honor, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Old School. What was kind of your biggest takeaway from... Uh, those experiences, whether it was like how how careers are shifting or how education works or maybe doesn't work uh, based on your experiences there? Yeah. So I think a lot about the, the tech industry, very similar to the music industry, where they're very accepting of anyone from any background, but at the same time, they aren't either. So like if you think about um, You music, have some experience there, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm a professional cello. So I've been playing the cello for a long time. Uh, I did a lot of studio musician work. But you can argue that there's actually way more talented people that aren't si signed to music labels outside of the music industry than the people that are actually signed. But the people that are outside of the music industry that want to get a shot have a lot of difficulty playing their record so the right person hears it and gives them the contract. Same thing with technology where, you know, there's a lot of talented people that went to college, some didn't go to college that are working in these companies, and they want to be accepting of everyone, but their filters for people still use traditional signals, whether it's a college degree or SAT or GMAT. And so the people that have talent have to go through a bunch of hoops to get in. But the question that you asked wasn't how to get in. So you asked, like, how was it inside? Right? Yeah. Well, so, what, what were the big insights that kind of maybe you're even applying today as you're building out career karma, yeah. but you saw all those years ago at alt school and honor and some of those other programs. Yeah. I think the biggest insight, not just with software engineering, but across the board with different skill sets is that there's a, a minimum barrier of social skills that people need. Mm. Um, a lot of people really focus on getting a skill to do their job and you can break in, you can graduate from the best school and do a really good job as a worker when you mm -hmm. break into tech. But if you wanna get promoted into any leadership role, it starts to become less about the hard technical skills and more about your soft skills and the way that you communicate, your, the way that you know how to manage, the way you're organized, um, the, how creative you are, um, how balanced you are, um, do people like you? A lot of things like that that are very touchy-feely. And yeah. so I would say the biggest uh, insights to career karma actually come from, you know, just really deeply studying industrial and, and workplace psychology mm -hmm. um, and the way and creating culture and what motivates people and what keeps people happy. And we think about ourselves more like psychosocial support for people. Um, and, and everything's done in teams in companies, but even in school as well, um, if you're going to be working at some of these top, top companies. You mentioned kind of these softer skills. 
what, you, what would you say are some of the soft skills that people screw up or don't understand uh, if they haven't had some training or had some experiences under the belt first? I think the biggest thing, the biggest first thing that you have to do is develop, develop a certain level of confidence in yourself. You have to convince yourself first that you're capable. How do you, you do that? To, if the first step is like really just telling yourself that you're good. Like if you decide to do something and it's very hard to tell yourself that I'm, I'm an artist. Like if I just started playing an instrument, but it doesn't matter whether you're professional or not. If you call if you play an instrument, you're technically an artist, right? That's like, if you first start learning how to code, you're technically that. Um, and the best way to do it is actually like to repeat that every single day to yourself. If you think about um, books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, you know, they talk about like naming your number that you want to make in the future and just like telling that to yourself every single day. So something we talk a lot about is like visualizing to realize. It might be reading people's biographies, putting a picture of someone that inspires you up every day and looking at that, reminding yourself about why you're doing this, right? So, you know, that might be for your kids or your family. So whatever it is that you want to do, it, it's really telling yourself that. Um, because what I often see is a lot of people when they're in the job search or even in companies, um, they haven't convinced themselves. And if you can't convince yourself, you're not going to convince other people that you're capable. And I'm not saying that the doubt will ever go away or the imposter syndrome will ever go away, but you have to start with you. And it sounds hard, but that's actually the easier part. If you can convince yourself, then everything else starts changing, actually. Is there a moment that that happened for you? For instance, did you ever have to convince yourself as you made this transition from uh, maybe your primary identity being cellist or primary identity being, you know, I, I think you had a, a background uh, in the finance world prior to this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In transitioning your identity to a tech leader? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that you say things about identity. So talking more about psychosocial things, right? A job is way more than income. It's about identity. Yeah. A lot of people focus on presenting themselves as, um, you know, they define themselves by what they do and what school that they went to and things like that. But if we're embracing a world of lifelong learning, where people work at multiple companies and go to multiple schools in a lifetime, then you can actually live multiple lives. Like if people are living longer and one year, one or three years, you're an investment banker, another three years, you're an engineer, another three years, you're a salesperson, and then blah, 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 you're a podcast, then you start a company. Now you, you've learned all the skill sets that you need to start something new. I think for me, I've been blessed to have a pretty healthy dose of confidence, but I will say um, on this entrepreneurship journey, there's definitely been moments where you know, I've convinced myself of what I know is right. I can see the proof in the pudding with the users, um, but there's other people that don't see what I see. And so I have to always remind myself every day that I'm right by talking to the users, by talking to my team, by iterating on the product and seeing the numbers move up and to the right. And so it's less of a... Um, doubting of myself and more of looking at the the evidence that I'm on the right path. So if yeah. you've already convinced yourself that you are good and you believe in yourself, then it's more about like making sure that you're making consistent results to keep yourself motivated and hype because what's consistent between millionaires and billionaires and the people that we've met that are on this level is not the fact that they are geniuses or rock stars or, or privileged um, which are all factors. Uh, the main thing is actually that they didn't quit and they persisted and they kept their light at the focus. They kept, they focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I, I really like that uh, that way to kind of frame it. And you mentioned um, this idea of of putting a person on the wall, like a picture of someone on the wall that inspires mm -hmm. you. Who inspires mm -hmm. you? And it doesn't have to be someone you necessarily tape to your wall, but yeah. Uh, there's a few people that I study. Um, I really like Masa, who is the CEO of SoftBank. Mm. Um, I really like... Why is that? Uh, 
the way that he thinks. So I, I, for the people that know don't know SoftBank, but they started um, the Vision Fund, uh, which essentially is a hundred billion dollar fund. They blo- deploy about a billion in capital every week. Um, but he he takes big bets and it's very risky with what he does. And he also encourages his companies to work together in order to achieve his vision of the world or to address the problems that he sees in the world and enables the people that are experts or that have experienced those problems themselves to have the fuel that they need to pursue their dreams. Um, He has accomplished a lot, but he doesn't rest. And he he doesn't have just a big level of thought. He also has a sense of urgency, which I think is very important. Um, so I really like him. He's also a, a student of 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 um of books. He reads a lot. Um, and I'm fascinated with Japan because Japan is where there's more companies that are over 100 years old than anywhere else. Yeah. Um, and they have a really uh nice culture. Um, as well. And so um, I like Masa. Um, and, I, and I recently met Marcelo Clor, who um, runs the Latin American Vision Fund, uh, Latin American Fund for them as well. I um, mean, just the both the both the ways that they think is, is very interesting to me. Um, and there's a lot of other reasons, but those are the main ones. Um, obviously, I think Elon Musk, for similar reasons, I actually think Elon Musk is it's hard for me to put them on the same level. I would say like they're on similar levels. I don't know. I, I kind of lean more on Masa's level because I think he's like on a, doing more grander, taking bigger bets mm. uh, in multiple areas. I mean, it's hard to say who's making bigger bets, but it's not about comparison. Like, right. so I would just say that's Different another things. person. It's that, another yeah. person that inspires me. I like, I like that he's focused on fundamental needs in the world, like energy, right? And transportation, um, and all kinds of other things. So I, I, I like that um, that he puts his capital to work. He's never like just hoarding cash. He's always putting it back to work. Um, I like that he has five kids. Um, in the future, I want to have five kids. So I think you know to see someone that's on a on a powerful level that also has five kids is is inspiring to me. Um, on an organizer level, I'm very inspired by. Malcolm X, and I really like Malcolm X's autobiography. Um, I'm a big fan of Dr. Martin Luther King. I actually have a poster of him in my wall. Nice. Um, and he um, he actually has been talking about automation and basic income and, and the future work for a long time. Um, there's a really good article by Dr. Martin Luther King um, in Playboy magazine, actually, 1965, <laughs> talking about automation. Um, and he really focused on getting his message out where people are. Um, and I'll say the last people that I really think about a lot are um, <laughs> are Avon Barksdale and Stringer Bell and The Wire. Best uh, series <laughs> of all time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'll say those are the the those main. Those guys people. are, are uh, slightly <laughs> slightly more criminal than the other. Uh... Yeah, yeah. But they, but they, it's like it's like bad people wanting to do good, good people supposed to be wanting to do good, but they're actually doing bad. Um, and there's just like people be, and, it, and it shows all aspects. There's the criminal side, there's the political side, there's the education side, there's the, where the product comes from, there's market dynamics. And so I think like studying a show like that from all the different angles is, there's a lot of lessons there. Um, cause the world, I mean, there's a lot of corruption there too. And so you really got to understand how all those pieces are involved. If you think about what we're focused on with workforce development, there's education. There's companies, there's government that's providing a lot of financing. There's corporations that are providing financing. There's individuals going to the school, um, yeah. and way more people that come from low-income backgrounds that are trying to get in here that are unaware of what's going on, the dynamics. And then there's players in the quote-unquote good and bad side that are essentially trying to figure out how to navigate this new world. Um, and so, yeah, yes. <laughs> I, like, I like that. It's uh, inspiring for me to go back. I, obviously, the people you mentioned, I'm I'm familiar with, and mm-hmm. have have some general awareness of. But it makes me want to go and uh, dive a little deeper into some of the mm-hmm. autobiographies and biographies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of stories, 
you know, you kind of broke into this uh, career karma opportunity based on these conversations you were having on your podcast, breaking into startups, mm -hmm. talking to people from uh, with untraditional backgrounds, getting into tech. Was there sort of a, a common denominator there of, of some qualities that all of them had or or maybe not all, but like some of the patterns that you started to hear after, you know, your 12th one, your 25th one, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people there. And I imagine you see some of those things that smart people are doing to uh, break into the tech world. Yeah, I think um, after doing hundreds of interviews with people on the podcast, on the education side, it's clear that um, something's going to happen related to student loans and that more and more innovation is going to be coming from colleges and from individuals in order to address changes. So like, you know, after Clay Christensen talked about half of the colleges going bankrupt in the U.S. over the next five to 10 years, you know, you start seeing, you know, colleges themselves launching boot camps. You see, you know, in the, in the beginning, boot camps charging tuition up front realizing that there's only a few people that can afford that um, and then launching, you know, a better version of student loans that helps some other people. But then for the people that didn't have student loans, like they had to do something for them. Um, and uh, then the income share agreement came about. We could talk about all these things later. And then there's people that had scholarships and employers pair model innovating on this, giving people access to pursue an education or what they love without going into debt. But I think in addition to the income share agreement, which I think is the most innovative out of all of these things, in addition to employers pay, um, you saw schools launching um, part-time, full-time, uh, self-paced uh, versions of their programs online and offline. Um, yeah. I think the online um, aspect of things actually has changed dynamics a lot um, because you can see not just boot camps, increasingly going online, but also um, more and more, um, more and more colleges launching online versions of their education. Yep. And the problem with online education is that there's a lot of people that enroll and get excited about it, but the completion rates are low, right? So if you, since, since massive open online courses have existed or MOOCs um, over the last seven years, there's been over a hundred million learners with you know, five to 15% completion rates. Um, and so it, it's very, you could want to do something, but you need discipline. And so that, I just explained everything kind of like on the education side, not everything, but just kind of high level on the education side. On the individual side, what was clear is that um, you can have all the desire to want to become a software engineer or a salesperson or a product manager in the world, but if you don't have the discipline to make it all the way through, it's going to be hard, and only uh, and the there are some people that we've interviewed on the podcast that are self disciplined and practice um, have have mindsets of there's this concept called deliberate practice, and they know how to negotiate, they know how to tell their story. But the yeah. majority of people need a support system, and a support system is not just a group of individuals to mentor you. It might be peers that are just like you, so you have hope that it's possible. Because if you hear from a man that is possible and you're a mom, it's hard to believe that sometimes. Um, and you might have a support system of people, but you might not have a laptop or you might not have a house or you might not have food. Um, and understanding how to address all those needs are, are, are what we started seeing is like a lot of gaps. Um, and what was key is more schools started to providing started providing different things in that regard and we started to see a fundamental shift in um individuals increasingly wanting to seek for alternatives outside of college yeah. and an opportunity to, to give them essentially a career gps system that would guide them to the right schools but more importantly the right people that would be a, an accountability buddy system to help them not just make the decisions but stay in the program, finish the program and get a job after. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's essentially the main, the main themes that we saw there. How hard is it to stand out as a software developer today? Like how, how crowded is the space? And you know, if you're graduating from one of these boot camps, what are some of the statistics that you've found interesting as you've been, I'm sure studying this space like crazy 
mm-hmm. as you're launching, growing this startup and mm-hmm. uh, coming out of the Y Combinator program, talking to investors probably. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what are some of those bigger shifts happening right now? Yeah, the, the numbers are definitely fresh in my mind. So like today, <laughs> there's over, I mean, let's talk about the iPhone, right? The iPhone didn't exist. It, it came out, the iPhone 4 came out 2007. The App Store came out 2008. Yeah. Software developers haven't been around for the last 10 years, a little over 10 years, right? And so that today, there's over half a million open jobs available. You're talking about mobile developers? I'm talking about developers in general. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that could be a mobile developer. That could be, you know, website developer. It could be all kinds of things, right? Yep. Because there's different types of developers, front end, back end, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's over half a million open jobs for software engineers and only 50,000 people graduating with computer science degrees every year from four-year universities and about 30 to 40,000 people graduating from coding boot camps every year. And so in total, let's say 100,000 people graduating a year and over a half a million open jobs, right? And by 2024, which is the next five years, there's 1.4 million open jobs and only about 400,000 people that are going to be graduating from four-year universities, which means a million people are going to have to get trained from some alternative form of college, right? On the flip side, there's about 300,000 people applying to coding boot camps every single year, but the majority of them aren't getting in, not because they are incompetent, it's because they aren't ready. They don't know how to prepare. Because um, if you think about what a boot camp is, a boot camp essentially takes what normally requires two to four years to learn and condenses it into about three to 12 months, sometimes longer. Some boot camps are a little longer. They might do like a year or two program for people, but you can leave earlier if you want to. But overall, it's a condensed version of college that focuses on practical skills that are relevant in the workplace. And if the majority of people are doing an income share agreement, the main difference between a boot camp and college is that they measure their success on you getting a job, right? And so if the only way that teachers get paid is if you get a job, then the schools need to be selective about who comes in to make sure that they start and finish because if they don't finish, none of this works. Yep, right? yep. And so there's this big opportunity to, the, the jobs aren't going away. Um, there was something that came out this morning um, that said, for the first time um, in history, our history, um, there are 7.4 million open jobs versus 5.8 million job seekers in the U.S. economy today. Yeah. Um, that's not all software engineering jobs, but it's an issue. Across the, the world, there's 35, 30 to 50% of the world workforce is working part-time, inactive, or like unemployed. And if, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, you mentioned people who are unemployed. Mm-hmm. Obviously, getting into software development is a great place to go because you've got more demand than supply. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's mm-hmm. great, um, great pay, especially compared to no salary, no, no income at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. it seems to me like in order to really solve this gap, uh, the tech world is going to need to bring not just people who are unemployed or underemployed into tech. Um, or, you know, people whose maybe jobs are being automated, like truck drivers, mm-hmm. other, other industries like factory workers, mm-hmm. but even people in other professional settings, you know, people mm-hmm. in, in sales who sell widgets or yep. people in um, finance, you know, bankers at uh, bank chains, but more and more people are using mobile apps and nothing against those, those roles. But if, if someone in those roles were considering getting into software development, why would why would they want to consider um, taking the leap to go into a coding academy? What's on the other side of that for them that maybe doesn't exist in a role as a banker at Chase, for instance? Yeah, um, I'll talk about the banker example because I was an investment banker before too. Sure. Um, and before getting into that, I would say even software developers themselves are needing to reskill. Um, yep. A lot of people that come to Career Karma wanting to do a boot camp. They sometimes get into this paralysis by analysis, um, deciding which language to learn, not realizing that 
by the time you're in the workforce um, and you've been working for maybe one to three years, maybe five, um, what you've learned is outdated and you got to learn something new. Yeah. And you're constantly learning something new. Um, so it's like, you can't just be like, I'm going to learn this and I'm going to be good forever anymore. You have to always adapt, even salespeople. Cause like, like you said, like the way you sold historically, just with the phone, like now you, you need to know how to use Salesforce. You got to learn how to use outreach. You got to learn how to use all these different tech stacks. Um, so the best software developers are constantly upskilling, not just by working on new projects, by, but literally taking more curriculum. The best people in general um, are constantly um, learning and yeah. assessing their skills versus the job market and trying to grow. Um, there's a really good concept called Tours of Duty by Reed Hoffman, uh, where he talks a lot about this type of stuff. There's a book called Alliances that breaks this type of stuff down. Yeah. Um, and even employers themselves being comfortable where with an employee that's only going to be there for three years or four years and then leaving somewhere else. Um, but going to your point about like what, what go, what's on the other side for an individual, like a truck driver that's trying to see what's going on. Um, you know, technology, people keep referring to the technology industry, like a separate industry, but it's not anymore. Essentially entire trillion dollar categories are going to be recreated. Like before, you know, technology made a lot of really nice things to have that were fun to use, like, I don't know, Instagram or Facebook and this important companies. But increasingly, technology is moving into these, like, really fundamental high GDP categories, um, like food, transportation, um, housing, finance, like with Open Door, um, Uber, Lyft, Zillow, um, things like that. Um, beyond meat that's going crazy right now, right? With vegetarian food. Um, and so if you think about that, um, if you're a company and you don't have technology at your core, then you're not gonna survive. Um, I don't know if this stat is perfectly accurate, but I'll just say one of my friends who works at Goldman told me that today, one in four employees at Goldman now has to know technology. Um, there's some reports that did come out from um, JP Morgan um, and some other people that are like requiring Python for certain departments for people. Um, uh, banks themselves are like really, I think JP Morgan has put in like over $300 million towards um, future work and alternative uh, forms of training. Um, more and more companies are dropping the college requirement to apply for a job like, um, like uh, Google and IBM. Um, I think Home Depot, Glassdoor, a bunch of other companies as well are dropping the requirement to have a college degree. But if you didn't go to college and you have the skill set, it's still difficult to stand out. So to your point, um, this is something that I think is one of the biggest challenges for people when they graduate from boot camps. Because what's nice about boot camps is that they are aligned with the workforce. And if you believe in yourself and you know that you have the skills, that's a great step. But the job search is a completely different skill. And the best way that we've seen to get a job with and stand out is actually not applying through the website. Um, because applying through the website is going to get you to a recruiter that's not that has a very important job, but is not in a decision-making position and optimizes for people with traditional backgrounds because their time is limited. And what you need to focus on is either hiring managers that have similar backgrounds to you on a personal level and figure out a way to get in touch with them so you can connect with them and get them to vouch for you and skip the normal recruiting process, sell yourself, pass the technical challenges, and get an offer on the table. And we plan on doing all those things through Career Karma as well, but essentially that's what's worked for um, us and for other people. And that's even today, even at Google and Facebook, most of their jobs are offline and come through referral, even with their extremely sophisticated recruiting systems, because there's so much talent that exists out there that it's hard for them to identify. So they rely on their internal networks to get them their people. If you're considering being a software developer or even upskilling, it, it, seemed, it occurs to me that you kind of want to skate to where the puck is going mm -hmm. a little bit, right? You, you want to kind of like know what is the role of software developer going to be five, 10 years out so that you're upping your skills with that in mind. Mm -hmm. What is the future role of software development? How, how is the role of software developer changing? 
I think that um, when I think about software engineers, um, they're increasingly getting involved in more departments, right? So it's not just like building a product. Um, you're starting to actually see like marketing teams be engineers, right? It's not like Mad Men anymore. Right. It's like, like growth really hackers, have, right? It's like growth hackers. You got to understand the difference between SEO and SEM. You got to understand A-B testing. You got to understand the way uh, websites are built so that they're formatted, so they're optimized for sort search. You have to understand sales even to create really good drip campaigns for your newsletters and your follow-up and things like that. Like my co-founder, Archer Meister, he does more for me than my entire sales and marketing teams that I had historically when I was working at those other companies, Honor and, and Hustle and Alt School, by himself um, because he knows the game and he, he understands how to do that. So um, you'll see uh, engineer, like uh, we did an interview with John Maeda, who's at Automatic, um, and he talks a lot about engineers learning more about design and designers learning more about how to code. Yeah. Um, and because it's not enough to build something for people, if you're doing things that are solving problems for the non Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's increasingly important for them to know how to use the product and design is very good for that. And it's really important for it to take into account emotions as well. Um, uh, one of our friends at Lever talked about how one reason startups suck at recruiting is because it's actually a lot of emotional labor um, and juggling a lot of details and reading people's situations and creating space for deep combos and aligning goals, driving decisions, like tech doesn't know how to value emotional labor. So what I'll say is engineers, are starting to think deeper about the soft things that users deal with, um, that people deal with. Um, and I think that's going to be uh, more and more of a factor. I think the other thing that's happening with engineers is the growth of uh, remote work. So remote work is a huge, huge, huge thing. Stripe just launched its fifth engineering hub as a remote office, hiring 100 engineers completely remotely, uh, which is great news for people. Um, it's interesting because um, we think about the gig economy, the gig economy is taken off. Like, and for the people that don't know the gig economy, that's like Uber and Lyft and uh, TaskRabbit and all these temporary jobs, well, no low blue collar jobs. They're, they're good jobs that are flexible for people, but most people that are in those jobs actually don't want to do them forever. Right. Um, and so figuring out how to get to the next phase and level up out of that is, is key. Um, but the remote jobs actually give you that type of flexibility and the benefits and the permanent job. Um, but some people do like the gig job. So it's not a, this is not a shot fired at a gig economy. It's just um, a parallel to remote work that gives you the benefit of a full-time job and flexibility and perm and benefits um, with, yeah, exactly. So. What, um, what, let's say you're, you want to find the right job for you. Mm -hmm. But you're kind of starting from scratch. You're mm -hmm. you're going to be done with your boot camp here in let's say 90 days. Mm -hmm. How should you approach your tech job search? Mm -hmm. I I like that. Um, I actually think even before you get into your job search, you should start listening to the Powder Cake podcast and <laughs> identify the people that are engineers or that are like you that are working at companies. They don't have to be engineers people that are like you on a personal level that you would love to work for or that are connected to people that you want to work for in the future and grab tea with them, grab coffee with them and, and get to know them on a personal level first. That way, and the a easy way to connect is be like, hey, I heard the Powder Keg podcast and this thing really jumped out to me about you. I would love to like meet you and talk to you more about that because you know I'm doing this for these types of people in Indiana today. Right. And that is going to be way more powerful than being like, hey, I want a job. And like, I'm like you. I went to your school. That is too robotic. Um, and so whenever you do get to the 90 day phase and you're in the job search, you're going to be like, hey, remember me? And of course, they're going to have a great feeling remembering you. And you're going to let them know that you're in the job search and they're going to help you. And if you don't get a job at their company, they will vouch for you for other companies. So you really want to be building those personal relationships earlier. 
But if you are 90 days out, start 90 days out. Three months is a good amount of time. And you can do the same type of thing, but really emphasize who they are. Like if you play basketball and they play basketball and you know where they play, pull up and shoot some hoops and kick their behind. They'll respect you. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> like it. Know you. So, yeah. <laughs> In your opinion, who are the best companies to work for? I know you, you probably work with a ton of companies. You've interviewed people who work at uh, dozens, if not hundreds of companies across the country. Mm -hmm. Who are the best companies to work for? In my opinion, this is my personal opinion. I think the best types of companies to work for are companies that are mid-sized with momentum. Mm. Um, so these are like Series C or below. For the people that don't know what Series C is, that's usually your third or fourth round of funding after a seed round from a venture capitalist, which essentially gives money to people to build companies. Um, so they tend to be anywhere from 10 to 200 plus employees. Um, and they, they aren't gonna run out of money anytime soon. They have product market fit, um, which essentially means that their product is working and they're making money. Um, but it's small enough to where you will be able to make an impact and you will be surrounded by people that can mentor you and you can build a network. You can get to know every single person at the company and take those relationships with you somewhere else. Um, talking about Y Combinator, um, um, Michael Seibel, who is the CEO of Y Combinator, recently put out a video talking about how uh, working at big companies can be a trap um, because it's not a startup right it's a corporation <laughs> you know and like part of the part of the value of working at a startup is like the intimate environment and the accelerated level of learning that you're getting and um that's nothing wrong with going to those big companies but if i were you listening to the powder Care podcast today i would go to the breakout list um and look at those companies that are there i would look at um Wealthfront puts out a list of companies with momentum, mid-sized companies with momentum every year. Look at those companies. Um, and then just go to your favorite venture capitalists and click portfolio and just look at those companies and find the ones that are series C or below um, that are aligned with your personal background. Because another way to stand out as a junior developer is picking companies that are aligned with your personal background. So if you grew up on a farm, find a food company that is aligned with what you've grown on your farm. And now you're applying as a senior like farmer that happens to know how to code. And it's way better positioned than anybody else on the team that understands food. Yeah, I like that. I, I, um, I, I think it's a good perspective, especially for someone who doesn't really know the world of startups. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a pretty safe bet going to mm -hmm. like a series C stage company that, you know, mm -hmm. has product market fit, you know, they got mm -hmm. traction and cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of startups out there. There's probably more startups than series C stage companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Career Karma is a startup right now. And, and mm -hmm. unless you made some serious progress since we talked last week, you haven't raised your series C yet. Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what should people know about working at a startup? What do you tell people um, when you're recruiting people to join Career Karma, mm -hmm. you know, not only what are the benefits, but what are some of the things, the realities of working at a startup? That's a great question. So there are trade-offs. Like if you're working at a company that's like our size or Series C or below. And your size is how big? See, we've raised a seed round. So we I, I, were- I mean, team, team size. Oh, team size. We're about 13 people. Okay. Yeah. So if you're working at a company that's 10 plus people, um, 10 to 100 people even. Um, I'll say the biggest change for most people is having to embrace ambiguity, having to embrace change. Like you might be hired as an engineer, but they might ask you to fold envelopes. They <laughs> might ask you to like sweep the floor and you can't say, that's not my job, right? Like you can, if you want to, but that's not the environment for you. Like they're not, they may not want to hire you, right? So like there's like, you're going to wear multiple hats. And, and if it's remote work, then obviously there's no floors to be swept. You just got to sweep your own because you're working from home. But the point is, is that like, you're going to be doing multiple things at a startup. Um, 
and you have to be comfortable with that. And that's also what's very exciting. And that's what's going to put you on an accelerated growth path. You never want to be in a comfortable position. You actually want to be growing. You always want to be in an uncomfortable position um, while still being comfortable. Like, because like you can't build muscle without resistance. Like, so you got to have a little bit of like breakthrough and push as you're going through. So um, if you're not, so if you're not challenging yourself at your job, you're not growing. And yeah. You're not reaching your full potential. Yeah, exactly. Like you always want to be setting a stretch goal, take yourself to the next level. So I say like, if you are someone that doesn't do well with change and wants just like structure and balance and stuff like that, like a startup that's early stage may not be the best thing for you. Um, straight up and down, you know, because, you know, startups are trying to achieve billion dollar goals and recreate categories. And the biggest thing, there's a great article by Paul Graham called Startups Equal Growth. And if today you have 10,000 users and tomorrow you have 100,000 users and then in six months you have a million users, the entire structure of the company is going to change like 10 times during that time period. And if you don't know how to adapt with all those changes, as soon as you get settled into one way of doing things, it's going to change. And if you're not cool with that, it's hard. It's going to be hard for you. I'm not saying it's possible, but you got to prepare yourself psychologically for that. Yep. So what, makes good, what makes a good startup culture? What makes a good startup culture? I think um, a very clear mission and very strong company values that aren't just marketing, right? Because like, because we are entering into a world where companies are solving problems for the Damasio hierarchy of needs. And because CEOs understand that these are multi-billion dollar categories, sometimes trillion dollar categories, they understand that the best marketing is a mission, right? But if it's not understood by the entire company and it's not something that's lived, it's not even felt by the users, then that's an issue. Because I've, I've, I've worked for companies that I won't name where the mission was strong, the product and the service was good, the users loved it, but internally it was toxic and it did not reflect what was felt on the outside. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where you'll know it when you feel it um, and why I think it actually, you should actually take time during your job search and treat each interview like a blind date where you actually had some information beforehand so you could do some research before you got there so it's not completely blind, right? Yes. And you are evaluating them just like they're evaluating you. And then you're deciding who you want to date, right? I mean, you don't always want to take the first offer and sometimes you want to negotiate. Um, and so I really I really think that um, um, the culture, like assessing someone's interview process also reflects culture. Um, I think assessing people's language reflects culture, yeah. um, assess, like seeing, um, whether how they prioritize different things, whether it's technical, non-technical, whether it's things to balance, whether they do things as a group or as an individual, it's really, um, hard to define, but I would just say, um, look at how many people start with the company and leave the company. Um, and that says a lot because breaking into tech is one thing, staying into in tech is another. And so very similar with like getting admitted into boot camps. Um, that's a challenge for a lot of schools, but dropout rate is big, not just for boot camps, but also for colleges. Same thing. If somebody breaks into a company, how many people stay, right? That is not always a reflection of an individual wanting to leave. A lot of times it's a reflection of like not feeling heard. And I'll say, yeah. oh, I think, I think that right there is I think making sure your workers feel heard and feel empowered and supported and, and that they have growth um, and agency, I think is probably one of the biggest, the biggest things. I, like as a CEO, I, I like to say CEO stands for create every opportunity. And like that. for me, I really focus on, I got that from two chains manager. <laughs> nice. But I, I like to think about, um, about um, you know, me doing all the work that people don't want to do um, and then like 
figuring out how to do it and then delegating that to someone and then taking the next task. And essentially like I serve everyone. So we want to, as leaders, we want to serve everyone and empowering, empower them to be leaders themselves. If you feel like there's always a foot on your neck and you can't arrive, you can't rise above who's in charge of you, then that's usually a problem in my opinion. Yeah. I like that. Well, before we wrap up here, what is career karma's mission? Yeah. So um, our mission we haven't actually defined our mission, but we want to help a billion people in 10 years. And I'll say that, um, you know, our North Star is to empower people to make their most important career decisions. And like I said before, today, we want to help people decide which coding boot camp is best for them. But tomorrow, we want to help them make the most important career decisions of their life, not just for software engineering, but for anything else. So if you think about career paths like flights, and everybody is always on a flight, the destination is the company. The schools are like the airlines and the plane with their friends that they get on are like the squads inside of Career Karma. And so Career Karma is essentially the air traffic controller that helps people uh, find the routes that get them to wherever they want to go the fastest. Um, and uh, we're going to stay laser focused on matching people with the right coding boot camps, helping schools. Um, admit students without interviews because we've done all the pre-qualifying and nurturing beforehand. Um, and once we master that on the marketplace side of things, then we'll um, get the retention side right, the outcomes right, and essentially not just become the world's largest community of people with in-demand skills, but also the world's most powerful staffing firm. So, If there's one people you want people on this, uh, listening to this podcast to do, what's, what would that be? I will. I want them to download the app. I think even if you don't want to become a software engineer, I think downloading the app to really understand what we're building and how powerful it is, I think is a very big deal. So download Career Karma. Send me a message in Career Karma that you heard this podcast. Um, I think that would be awesome. Um, and then whether you are someone trying to code or you want to tell your friends about code or you just want to um, you're an educator, you want to figure out how to, or an entrepreneur that wants to start showing on school. Like, I love speaking with people. I think about myself like a social engineer, a social entrepreneur. Um, and so I really, um, I really want to connect with you. So, yeah, send me a message in the app. I love it. Ruben, thanks so much for, uh, for sharing uh, your perspective, your story, what you're building. And thanks for doing it while wearing a Chicago jersey. That makes us Midwesterners feel so good. Yeah, man. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, Chicago's my favorite team. So, <laughs> so. you must be a 90s child as well. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. Jordan, Jordan era was a good time. That's the golden age of hip hop, um, a bunch <laughs> of other things. Um, I used to live in Chicago. I started my career in Chicago. I used to live on Ohio and Franklin. And so, you know, I, I plan on being in the Midwest a lot. I love it. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for being here. We'll make sure we link up uh, your, your bio and all the links to your social profiles there. That's it for today's show. Thanks so much for listening. Also, obviously, huge thanks, Ruben Harris. Uh, check them out, careerkarma.com or Career Karma in the App Store. Uh, show notes are at powderkeg.com. And also, if you're looking for a job in tech to ignite your career or maybe just to make a shift, see what else is out there. Go to powderkeg.com to get started. Uh, it's super simple. Go to powderkeg.com slash jobs. You fill out the form. We do the rest of the work. You'll just get offers uh, to go out for coffee, hop on a Zoom call uh, with some awesome CEOs and hiring managers in the Powder Keg community. And to be among the first to hear the stories about entrepreneurs, investors, and other tech leaders outside of Silicon Valley and inside of Silicon Valley, subscribe to us on iTunes at powderkeg.com slash iTunes. We'll catch you next time on Powder Keg Igniting Startups. That's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening. Also, huge thank you to Ruben Harris of Career Karma. You can go check him out at careerkarma.com. Make sure you also subscribe to the podcast, Breaking Into Startups. And for links to Ruben's social profiles and the other people, companies, and resources mentioned in this episode, head on over to powderkeg.com and check out the show notes. Again, that's powderkeg.com, P-O-W-D-E-R-K-E-G, all one word, dot com. One thing that we've got coming up is lots of virtual events. So be sure to check out some of those upcoming live streams and virtual experiences on powderkeg.com slash events full lineup there and lots of different topics that we cover. And if you're currently in the market for finding a new role, Powderkeg can connect you with awesome tech companies between the coast that are growing like crazy. 
Right now, you can apply for our free Matches platform at powderkeg.com slash jobs. Matches has a specialized focus on tech hubs outside of the valley, so you can easily navigate this opportunity-packed landscape for potential. Our job matching platform leverages thousands of participants, employers, and teams within our ecosystem to get you connected directly with decision makers, shortcutting the hiring process. Apply today for matches at powderkick.com slash jobs. And to be among the first to hear the stories about entrepreneurs, investors, and other tech leaders outside of Silicon Valley, subscribe to us on iTunes at powderkick.com slash iTunes. We'll catch you next time on the Powder Cake Podcast.